Britain and Ireland fought a war uh, in 1919 to 1921 at the end of the First World War. And then the Irish fought a civil war between 1922 and 1923. This produced a small island. It's a small island of barely 5 million people, um, which is divided with a border where the northern part, Northern Ireland, is part of Great Britain, um, and the southern part is the Republic of Ireland. Essentially, conflict on this island has been ethno-religious, that you have a division where predominantly the Republic is Catholic, nearly 90% of the population, whereas in Northern Ireland there is an equal division between a Catholic population and a Protestant population. That also obviously dictates people's views of the future of their island. The Catholics in the north largely believe they should be Irish, whereas Protestants in the north believe they should be British. You have a split in soccer, which leads to a Northern Irish team and a Republic of Ireland team. Rugby decides to stay as an all-island team, so it doesn't effectively recognise the border. The largest sport in Ireland, the Gaelic Athletic Association, the games of hurling and Gaelic football, again choose to take an all-island approach. Re-emergent cricket in recent years has taken the same stance, but critically many individual sports um, take different routes. Athletics, track and field, for example, decides that Northern Ireland should remain part of Britain and is recognised by the IOC as such, whereas other sports decide they will organise on an all-island basis and not recognise the border. Boxing would be a good example. And conversely, the IOC also recognises that decision. Um, the confusion about the border and what borders mean in a post-conflict world is complex. So the picture there is of a man called Johnny Carey. Uh, until FIFA stepped in in the 1960s, both Irish teams, Northern Ireland and Ireland, selected its players from the whole of Ireland. So Johnny Carey literally played for Ireland and then Northern Ireland in the space of four days in the 1940s. And I think it's one of the problems for post-conflict countries, um, post-conflict regions, is how international sporting bodies respond to the complexities of what happens. Clearly the issue I'm talking about today is the Northern Ireland conflict that runs from 1968 to 1998. Um, it's essentially a struggle between the British state, supported by Protestant paramilitaries, fighting a war for 30 years against Irish um, paramilitaries in the form of the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. Um, it's a low-level conflict. The state never breaks down, but isn't um, kind of outward emigration to avoid the conflict. Society, as it were, to some level does continue, but over the course of 30 years, 3,500 people are killed. It's a conflict that identifies itself in purely religious, ethno-religious terms, which means if you look at the map of Northern Ireland here, the green areas are where there is a high density of Catholics, the orange areas where there is a high density of Protestants, which means society divides itself along ethno-religious lines, which means that Northern Ireland is as I say, 20 years post-conflict, a very, very divided society. You'll see the walls on the top left-hand picture and the bottom right. They are literally dropped in between houses to separate the two communities. It's reinforced, as Prince Faisal said there, about other issues beyond sport. One of the key ones in Northern Ireland is the debate around education. 96% of all education in Northern Ireland is um, defined by religion. Catholic children go to Catholic schools. Protestant school children go to Protestant schools. Most Northern Irish children do not meet anybody from the other community until they attend college or enter the workforce at 18. So the geography of the conflict, even in a post-conflict area, reinforces this division all the way along. There is also a perception within sport that sport denotes identity. So loyalist paramilitaries, those paramilitaries who were fighting, as it were, for Britain, identified the Gaelic Athletic Association, which has a 99% Catholic membership, as a force of the Republican war machine. They christened it the GAA is the IRA at play. 
Um, and during the course of the conflict, 21 members of the GAA were executed by loyalist paramilitaries precisely because of their sporting choice, because the loyalist paramilitaries decided in 1984 that the GAA was part of what they termed the Republican war machine. Those 21 people, not one of them had any political affiliations. They were identified specifically because of their sporting choice. And Northern Ireland is unusual in that sport becomes a target for the conflict, be it, for example, the top left in 1997, uh, the, national, uh, the Grand National, a very famous steeplechase race in Britain, was targeted with a bomb threat by the IRA, and many sporting events were targeted for bomb threats, hoaxes, and attack. In 1994, six men were gunned to death in a pub while they watched Ireland play a World Cup match in USA 94 versus Italy. They were killed because they were wearing the green shirts of Ireland and cheering for an Irish team that they identified with as Catholics. They were killed by Protestant paramilitaries who in the press release the next day say those men were executed for cheering the wrong team. Aidan McInesby, bottom left, uh, was a hurler. Uh, hurling's like hockey in the air, if you like. Uh, he was walking across a border checkpoint with his hurl strapped to his back. The British Army mistook it for a rifle and shot him 16 times in the head. The bottom right, Sean Brown, 1997, was murdered after he was taken from his GAA club, where at 10 o'clock at night he was volunteering to lock up the premises. He was tortured for four hours and again shot 23 times before he died. He had no political affiliations. Nobody on that side had any political affiliations. They were chosen for execution because their sporting identity told their killers who they were. It also affects elite sport. Uh, I doubt whether any of you have heard Wayne McCulloch. Wayne McCulloch came here to Seoul in 19, 1988. And in 1992, as a boxer, he won silver in his weight division at the Barcelona Games. As I said before, boxing in 1922 did not recognize the border, which means if you're a boxer in Ireland, irrespective of your own identity, you can only box for the Irish Republic. Wayne McCulloch, as you can see from the right, his neighborhood is a fiercely loyalist pro-British neighborhood. As a young man, he just wanted to box. The rules decreed, the IOC rules decreed that he had to box for Ireland, not Britain, so off he went. In 1992, when he won his medal, his family gathered to watch the fight in their home. At the end of the fight, two of his cousins were walking home. They were picked up by paramilitaries and had their kneecaps blown off. The press release the next day said Wayne McCulloch's cousins were targeted for attack because he fought for the wrong country. These problems happened in 1995 with a riot at Lansdowne Road brought about by English soccer fans in an age of hooliganism. Their chant as they ripped seats out of the stand and threw them at Irish supporters was no surrender to the IRA. Again, the idea that sport and what coloured jerseys people wore dictated their political affiliation. And in recent years, the, ca the um, controversy over the Premier League player James McLean, currently at Stoke City. James McLean is from Derry in Northern Ireland. Uh, his cousin was killed um, in Bloody Sunday in 1972 by British troops. Each year in November for Remembrance Day to remember those British Army people who died in the First and Second World War, as you can see on the top picture, all Premier League players wear a red poppy as an act of remembrance. James McLean refuses to do that, saying that he cannot honour a British Army which killed members of his own family in Northern Ireland. Um, you can see some of the comments there. James McLean has become this very divisive um, figure because he again is bringing sport and politics together. The issue really though in Northern Ireland is how you deal with divided communities. Building walls is not an answer. It separates and divides, it does not bring together. And that has been a problem for sporting facilities. You see here on the right, um, the Falls Road Leisure Centre, which was, uh, provides sports facilities for the Catholic community in Belfast. 
literally 200 yards away on the other side of the wall is exactly the same building for the Protestants. Northern Ireland has one of the highest rates of sports facilities anywhere in the European Union simply because they build two of everything. They do not bring people together. At the ground, the key battleground for the future has been youth. Because sport is so divided along ethno-religious lines, what game you play denotes who you are. If you play Gaelic games, predictably you're Catholic. If you play rugby or soccer, you are predictably Protestant. How do you bring children together beyond those walls that have been built to play their games together? And there's been huge cooperation between Gaelic games, soccer and rugby to actually run summer camps, school camps, etc., to get children playing all games. So critically, they meet their peers before that moment when they're 18, they're going to the wider world. They meet each other through play. They build peace, understanding, and relationships through their communities. Not a community defines them as what they are, but their communities that bring them together. Also hugely successful in recent years, you don't think of Northern Ireland as a home of ice hockey. It never snows. Um, but Northern Ireland started about 15 years ago a franchise in the British Ice Hockey League. The British Ice Hockey League has been kind of successful. In Northern Ireland, it is the hottest ticket in town. Why? Because it's a neutral sporting space. Ice hockey doesn't come with the baggage of being a Catholic game or a Protestant game, it is a neutral space where the community can go together and cheer on the Belfast Giants, who've been very successful, where they're not defined by which neighborhoods they've driven in from. They're defined by their love of sport. And in a way, that ice hockey example is how you move it forward. Success has been obvious as well in the European Championships in 2016, in um, France, when both, sorry, the World Cup rather, when both, um, sorry, I'm right, the European Championships, 2016, um, when both Northern Ireland and Ireland qualified for the finals. The fear had always been that when Northern Ireland travel, it would take a predominantly Protestant crowd, and that once they gathered, they would resort to old-fashioned ways and chant anti-Irish and anti-Catholic songs and that the flags they would bring would speak to the conflict, not to a new world. I won't play you the videos on YouTube if you want to look at it. Um, what was heartening was that the years of education seemed to have paid off. First of all, the research showed that of those people who travelled to France to watch Northern Ireland actually represented the, the country in terms of it was a 50-50 split between Protestants and Catholics. They got behind their team. And rather than chanting anti-Irish songs, they took to their hearts and through their voices, Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline. Okay, not my favorite song, maybe not a great song, but to hear 20,000 Northern Irishmen and women and children singing this rather joyful song in a sunlit Paris day showed you how far the Northern Irish peace process had worked through sport in that they saw their game as celebratory, not as a way of marking territory. It was not a means of marking themselves out as one thing against the other. So to conclude, I want to sort of look at some issues and challenges. I think in a post-conflict situation where an agency, an NGO, or a government can go into, if you like, virgin territory and say to divided communities, let's play together. You can build that process. When you're going into a place like Northern Ireland, where people have had sporting identities tied to their ethno-religious identities for 100 years, and ask them to play together, they cannot conceive how they can do that. Because they have their games, and the other side have their games also, but the two games are not the same. 
And this is a problem in Northern Ireland. There is no one sport, apart from ice hockey, the example I gave you, around which to build consensus, around which to build a joy and an excitement and a passion for sport, which is not weighed down with the baggage of history of conflict and murder. And sport, in that sense, too often functions as part of a community's cultural heritage, which is historic rather than something that is forward-looking or future-thinking. And it is the critical thing in post-conflict societies that you have to address the deeper issues. Sport, as was said before, cannot do this alone. Unless you address basic human needs, be it food or water in some situation, or in a place like Northern Ireland, where it is housing, education, and employment, where everybody, irrespective of their background or perceived background, is treated with respect, sport will not cure all. This has to be a complete approach. And it's still a problem when the very idea of Northern Ireland is contested, where still, in the most recent opinion poll, 45% of the people in Northern Ireland want to create a greater island rather than remain part of Britain. And clearly, the issues around Brexit, Britain leaving the European Union, fine for Britain, it's an island. For Northern Ireland, it's a problem. It has a land border with the Republic. It has a land border with Europe. How does sport flow across potentially a hard border? And it's hard to envisage at some levels, and that's why I use the example of the Northern Irish soccer team. It's hard to envisage a genuinely shared sporting identity within post-conflict Northern Ireland. After 20 years, that work is ongoing. But until the walls and the divisions, the hard divisions between communities are torn down, where children can run down the street, not hit a wall, but can go through a space and play with their peers, then actually the creation of shared space is complex. So as I say, sport is part of a toolbox for peace. But after 20 years of post-conflict in Northern Ireland, all those other tools, such as policy areas of housing, education, employment, have to be addressed. But sport should be a shared space where people and communities come together. They come together to play. And critically, as you do, they come together and dream. Thank you.